Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone to the second of our three trauma-informed arts education webinars. I am Jackie Russell, Artistic Director and Co-Founder of Chicago Children's Theater. Since 2005, CCT has been Chicago's premier professional children's theater dedicated to creating inclusive and diverse theatrical productions and educational programs. We opened our first ever permanent home in the West Loop in 2017 in a former police station. We are also a national leader in developing new plays and we are known for reflecting Chicago's diverse communities in our work. We serve thousands of Chicago school children with in-school theater residencies and weekday morning matinees. We also offer a full slate of theater arts classes and camps year round and programs specifically designed for young people on the autism spectrum. All of these are now online, of course. Today, I would like to thank our webinar producer, Jamie Abelson, our partners at the Lurie Children's Center for Childhood Resilience and the Illinois Humanities for their generous support for these webinars. Today's webinar entitled Multidisciplinary Arts Education Approaches to Trauma is moderated by Carmen Holly. Carmen is a social worker at the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital. Mrs. Holly is a tier two training coordinator and has over 10 years of experience providing trauma informed intervention and mental health supports for children and adolescents. Now I will turn it over to Carmen. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. And hello everybody and welcome to our webinar. We are so excited to have each of you here with us this evening. And as Jackie mentioned, my name is Carmen Holly. And if you joined us last week, I was a panelist and today I have the opportunity to be a moderator um, for today's discussion. So we're gonna pick up where we left off in the first webinar, discussing what it means to be trauma informed and then move into a discussion and question and answer session talking about what role the arts can play in creating trauma informed spaces and programs. Now throughout the webinar, we encourage you to submit your questions and ideas into the chat box so we can bring as many of those questions into the conversation as possible. Now we know that through learning and growing together and having these types of webinars and discussions, we can begin to figure out the places and spaces that we can impact and how to use the arts to create trauma-informed programming and settings for all children. But first, I would like to introduce our wonderful panelists. So Reginald Harris, is a politically engaged, independently licensed clinical social worker, therapist, trauma trainer, and arts educator. Reginald is a former professional ballet dancer and is the founder of In Context Advising, a group that works with arts organizations to help them adopt trauma-informed care practices through strategy, training, therapy, and coaching. I would like to also uh, mention um, Veronica Stein, program director at Snow City Arts, She's not able to join us today, and uh, she, she, she sends her apologies. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Azizi Marshall. She's a leading mental health and whole living expert teaching women around the world how to become the healthiest, most successful versions of themselves possible. Azizi is the founder and CEO of the Center for Creative Arts Therapy and Arts-Based Psychotherapy Practice and Training Center in Chicago, and the owner of Creative Clinical Consulting. So welcome panelists and thank you for being here today. So what I thought that I would do is do some level setting before we get started. So Jamie's going to pull up some slides for us. And so what I thought I'd do is sort of bring us into the space um, to really talk about trauma-informed care. It's really just some level setting as we uh, kind of uh, dig into our content and topics for today. So what do we mean when we say trauma-informed? What does that look like? So what we're asking folks to do is shift their perspective from a traditional perspective to a trauma-informed perspective. And what that means is learning ways to respond appropriately to all children, but specifically those who have been exposed to trauma. It's about changing the question from what is wrong with this child to what has this child been through? Next slide. So what do you have to give up and what do you gain? And so we have different perspectives here on the slide, on the slide for you. So traditional perspectives see that children's challenging behavior are the result of individual deficits, but trauma-informed 
um, perspectives has us understand that children's behavior may be ways of coping with stress or traumatic experiences. Jamie, you can click us through. Traditional perspective understands behaviors as personal and purposeful, but trauma informed perspective, we understand that behaviors may be automatic responses to stress. In the traditional perspective, we focus on changing the individual. We're gonna change the child and therefore we fix the problem. But trauma informed perspective asks us to think about how we can change the environment. Traditional ways of thinking about this is adults need to uphold authority and control with children and families. But trauma informed perspectives, we know that we need to offer flexibility and choice to children and families. Traditional perspectives say that punitive discipline works, but we know that positive reinforcement is the way to go. And last thing I'll say is traditionally we thought that support for children exposed to trauma is the counseling professional's job, is the therapist, is the psychologist, but we know that support for children exposed to trauma is a responsibility of all adults that care about children in all places and spaces where kids live, where they learn and where they play. Next slide, please. So these, um, this is sort of encompasses all of the things we're trying to teach children. The trauma-informed perspective, the social emotional learning competencies with this added layer of race and equity. And so how are we teaching children to be responsible decision makers? How are we teaching them to develop relationships with, them, with themselves, right? with their peers, with their teachers, because we know that exposure to trauma can impact the child's ability to, to develop healthy relationships. In terms of self-awareness, how do they see themselves in the world? And how are, they, how, are they, um, uh, how are they able to acknowledge what comes up for them and, and how trauma impacts their ability to be self-aware? Social awareness, their ability to get along with others, their abilities to see themselves and others, to be empathetic toward others. And self-management, the extent to which they can manage those big emotions and how they can get along with people. And so all of these things are trauma-informed. All of these things are social and emotional learning competencies. And we would never, we would be remiss if we did not presence this whole idea of addressing race and equity in all places and spaces where we work with children, where children live, where they learn and where they play. Trauma impacts a child's perspective of themselves, their perspective of the world, the extent to which the world is safe, the extent to which adults are safe. And so we think about an invisible, an invisible backpack that our children and, and adults to some degree are carrying around. And in that backpack is the beliefs about themselves, about the adults who care for them and about the world. And so how can we use trauma-informed arts programming to help children repack that backpack, to help them build new experiences, to help them develop and foster resilience. All the critical pieces that we know goes into um, 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 sort of bouncing back and, 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 and healing from some of the traumatic experiences that they've been through. And how can we make, so the, our guiding star, right? How can we make children feel safe, feel capable, feel likable, and even lovable? And how can we use trauma-informed arts programming to, to do these things? Next slide, please. So if you wanted to say, all right, Carmen, so what's the basic, like if I had to give you a mic drop moment, this would be it. What does trauma-informed programming look like, feel like, sound like? Um, and this is what we want you to think about when you're thinking about creating a trauma-informed program. These three, so the critical factors, creating a safe environment, building relationships and connectedness, and supporting and teaching emotion regulation. And so if you notice, these are sort of embedded in and really kit a critical to the social emotional competencies that we talked about on the previous slide. But here, we call this our hamburger slide because the buns, like in theory, that hold the hamburger together, the buns here are culture and equity and self-care because we understand that we need to assess and act on ways to achieve racial equity in everything that we do and the critical importance of taking care of ourselves in the process. Those are also key parts to creating trauma-informed spaces for children.
And so with that, I want to bring our panelists into the conversation. So we're gonna do a little getting to know activity with our panelists. And then we have some questions. We'll have some, we'll open up some discussion with those of you who are with us this evening. And so I'd like to go ahead and ask, let's start with, um, this is gonna be Reggie for you and as easy for you as well to kind of get to know you guys. Um, in maybe two minutes or so, what does trauma-informed arts education look like, feel like, and sound like? Oh, wow. That's a big question for two minutes. <laughs> um, so um, I think that it's important for me to, to talk about and, and in some ways sort of distinguish when we think talk about arts education and which practices because I think there's some practices that lend themselves more to be more trauma-informed. I came from the background of classical ballet um, and I'm thinking about there a lot of the um, arts education programs that are rooted in um, teaching a traditional cultural practice that often does not mesh up with like contemporary modern cultures lend themselves to being traumatic. Right, so um, and so a trauma-informed uh, arts practice one is one that is able to clearly articulate and contextualize the why of the training, um, and then be comfortable in navigating folks through the conflicts in sort of modern life with these like sort of like archaic. Uh, practices and then able to celebrate when students um, are able to uh, arrive at moments of understanding and open one's mind to what that arrival looks like and how um, students then reflect back their understanding and interpretation of these cultural practices. A trauma-informed uh, practice in arts looks like one in which the teacher is able to separate a little bit more their personal relationship with their art form and their love of the art form um, with sometimes a student's rejection of that love and of that and of that art and be able to sit with that and be able to understand uh, why the student may not be absolutely in love with Shostakovich as you are in love with Shostakovich, right? Um, and then find and use those moments um, to build and strengthen relationships versus uh, seeing that rejection of Shostakovich as a deficit in the student. Excellent. Thank you, Reggie. I took some notes and I have some follow-up questions for you in a second. That was fantastic. All right, it's easy. What does trauma-informed edu arts education look like, feel like, and sound like? Yeah, so when, when I've been working with arts organizations, it's been helping them discover what safety looks like. And so safety can look very different from one child to another. And so it's figuring out what is going to build that sense of community, that sense of group cohesion amongst all the participants involved, as well as the practitioners. So that's one thing that I, I feel when we're educating people about how to work with these kids, it's also understanding your own trauma and your own trauma bias and your own sense of safety and what that means. So the clearer you are in what that means to you and what that looks like for you, the more support and the, the more mindful you can be when you start working with children who have been through trauma, who are currently going through trauma. Um, you know where your triggers are, you know what's, what's gonna get triggered in you when they say or do something as well. So then you can respond in a gentle way, in a mindful way, instead of a responsive way that could potentially cause more of, a, of an upset for the child. Um, Another thing is also support and being able to support the community that you're in. So for, for me, being able to go into communities, I always like to know what those communities are. So getting to know like the best places to eat. I know these, these are like small things, but it, it's things that connect you then to those kids. So then when they're talking about things, you can say, oh, I haven't tried that place. Is it any good? And it's just, it's getting to know <laughs> them on their level too. 
um, it's being able to work with that resistance and knowing that the resistance isn't about you. It's, it's about what they're going through and how they're dealing with somebody who's coming at them in a kind way. And it may be the very first time that they've experienced that. So it's odd, it's foreign, it doesn't feel normal. So they're going to push against it and realize that they, they need that support. They need that love. They need that unconditional positive regard. Yet it's going to be taken in a different way because it feels strange, odd, and possibly traumatizing to them because it's foreign. They don't know what it feels like. So to just understand that as you're coming in as this loving person who's wanting to teach them about the arts, like Reggie was saying, they may come at it at a different way and respond to it in a different way than you're coming at it. Thanks, Lizzie. You know, one of the things that came up for me and I was taking down notes is a consistent theme with you and, and Reggie's response is the um, or not, or relationships but also what, what baggage the adults bring into the space and how can we develop relationships? What comes up for us? You know, what are issues of our, our, our biases or not? Or what are the ways that we you know, um, are culturally sensitive or not? And all of those pieces, but the power and value of relationships. And so to not ask the question, well, the traditional perspective is, well, that kid needs to just figure it out and get it together. Or it could be, what am I, who is the me that I'm bringing into the space with the child? Um, and what are some of the work I need to do to be fully present um, with the student or, or, or um, with the kid and all, all of the work that we're doing with them? How can I be fully present and acknowledge what comes up for me so that I can develop a relationship with that child? And so I think that um, for all the arts educators and adults in the space, it's really um, about what comes up for us and the extent to which we're aware of that and, and willing to do some work. So thank you guys both for that. And Carmen, if I may add really quickly, I want to say that yes, and and absolutely, and I like co-sign everything as easy said. Um, but it's also when you when we say to a kid, figure it out and get it together, we have to, I think it's important for us to reflect like what is figuring it out and what is getting it together. And 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 whose definition is of together is, right? And just that critical piece of trauma-informed care from a practitioner standpoint, first and foremost, is a deep delve and deep exploration of self, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that, that is it, right? Before you even figure everything, you have to absolutely know who you are and how you show up and why you are, and truly, and sounds simple, why are you in front of the classroom? Right, like that why has to be a very clear why. Um, before we can start those practices, but yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Reggie. Okay, question number two for our panelists. Share an example of how the creative arts have helped you move through a challenge you faced in your work. Share an example of how the creative arts have helped you move through a challenge you have faced in your work. I'll, I'll start. I actually, I grew up with two parents who did psychodrama. So my upbringing was whenever there was a challenge at home, we would act it out. That's, that was our normal. And my father being a psychodramatist, he was also someone who had been involved in gangs, um, who um, was in the Black Panther party. And so we would go together when I was a teenager, he'd go into St. Louis and into a couple places in New York and we would do conflict resolution between the different gangs. And he was, you know, mad respect for him because they knew that he was involved in gangs before. So they like coming in there, they felt like they, that he would understand who they were. So in this work, we would act things out. They didn't know we were doing theater. That wasn't the, the process that they were expecting. So when we went in, um, there was a kid who was saying that in order to solve his problem, he was going to kill somebody. And so, you know, this is like a normal conversation that they have all the time. And so my dad said, okay, well, that's what you want to do. Let's see what happens. And so we acted it out in that moment, right then and there, what it would be like if that were to happen. Um, we didn't go into the gory detail, but it was more the consequences of that behavior. So we went through what he would have to tell his mom when he was in jail. And so he had to have that conversation with his mom. He then had to apologize to the grandma of the child that he killed and have that conversation with her. He then had to go back into the past and talk to himself as a child to say, hey man, don't do it, it's not worth it. And then the, everybody then who was involved was able to process what it was like to say, 
this is a choice, but here are several other choices that you could make and they could see in real time what those options would be. And then at the end, we processed and said, okay, so what choices are you now going to make for yourself moving forward? And how are you gonna do that? So that's just the power of the arts and being able to talk about something, but then bring it in into the stage, bring it onto its feet and see it and play it out and watch it and then explore it. I think that's, that's what's so powerful about the arts, being able to do that. Ooh, that was fabulous. Oh, thank you, Rachel. So <laughs> That was my life growing up, so. <laughs> um, you know, I would add, so uh, I think a sort of a, a different perspective is this. So my nine to five is that I work as an affordable housing developer. So I spend my day working in cities around the Midwest, working with projects. And I think about what I bring, I, I didn't and develop and manage social and economic supports that are critical for an affordable housing project to be successful in a city, right? So it's this very macro level kind of like social work with like housing, I'm dealing with finance people and all those things. Nothing against finance people, but you know, I'm a creative, right? And what I bring to this, is so, so one thing about being an artist is that you will even in and even with someone who's like trained in classical ballet is very rigid. There's this there, there's always a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh way, right? There's, you know, like there's there's something is always a possibility, right? And because we we train for this idea of perfection and we know that we'll never get there, there's a a willingness to try, right? Like, wow, I'm just gonna try this. And so then couple, so, so, so that sort of orientation of always figuring out, well, let's just do it a different way, right? Like, let's just try something different. Um, coupled with that trauma-informed lens of, of recognizing that my colleagues are all bringing their own stuff to the work. So I'm doing this thing of like diagnosing and assessing like, oh, you probably had a really difficult time with uh, transition from, you know, <laughs> leaving, leaving things behind. Okay, that's holding you back from wrapping up this project and you're really a punctual person, right? And so I do this thing where I'm like, oh, okay, you're, it seems to me you might be bringing this sort of experience and you're bringing that sort of experience and this is getting in the way of thinking about creative ways. Um, and so I have a colleague that says to me, he is, uh, he's like an engineer and an architect. And so he's a very much, he wants to solve problems through processes. It's like, okay, well, we just have a process in place and I'm very much interpersonal. I'm like, we're not communicating well. And so <laughs> if we're not communicating well, like, I don't think you really like me and that's okay, but like, we need to address that. <laughs> and so I think that that is that sort of process that comes comes up uh, for me in, in, in thinking about how the creative art helps me in my like real, just kind of like mundane day-to-day -day stuff. Thank you guys. You know, that it's really interesting as I think about the, the how powerful and impactful both of your stories are and the value of, of, of how, how there are so many ways that we, that we can use arts to foster resilience and, and be trauma-informed. And so I think so we have actually a question from, um, from one of our um, attendees here. So I'm gonna ask you all to, I'm gonna pitch it out and ask you guys to respond. So the question is, do the panelists have any pieces of advice for a young educator just starting to go into the field that they wish they might have had earlier in their career or their work? Pieces of advice for a young educator just starting out that you wish that you would have had earlier in your career. Just easy, go ahead, please. <laughs> I would just think, be patient with yourself and, and, and trust, trust yourself. Uh, there are gonna be so many times where you're going to be in a classroom and you're like, what is happening? Why is this so chaotic? And, and understand that it's going to happen. And to also understand that when those moments happen, each and every time they happen, you will learn something. You will learn something, you will adapt to what's going on and you will change it for next time. So 
think about it as you will be able to constantly improve upon yourself as long as you are constantly open to questioning and discovering who you are and who the students are in your classroom. So being open, being patient, and, and trusting in what you've learned and trusting in yourself. Absolutely. I just want to echo and say again, patience, 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 patience. It is a teaching is a practice just like any other practice. It is like the violin. It is like dance. It is like running or weightlifting or anything you do with repetition and time spent in the practice is absolutely critical to work. So that patience piece, I just can't stress enough. And also the focus is should be about the relationship. One of the things that was really frustrating for me when I was working in schools was like every other year there was a new framework. You know, they was like, oh, now we did the Danielson framework. Now we're doing Charlotte's framework. Now we're doing Joe's framework. Now we're doing Frank's framework, you know. Then, the, you know, just, and, and, and nothing against innovation, but it was just always this thing, uh, a, a way of, 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 you know, scaffolding and, and engaging work. But what I often felt was missing was like the relationship, right? For me, what's ideal is that a student is excited to come to your class. That a student, even if the student's really challenged by you, and even the student really maybe that doesn't even like you that much, they like the way they feel when they are learning in your class. And that's the thing is like, what is the relationship? And, and to pay attention to those clues. Because I've also often had to coach uh, some, some educators on, on students that show up every day to their class and disrupt. And they're like, I'm so frustrated with them. That why, if, they're, if they're not going to do anything, why are they in the class? I said, but they show up. They come back every day. They don't, they don't go to this other teacher's class and disrupt, but they come to your class and disrupt. Why, why do they keep coming back to you? That's a reframe, right? And, and thinking in those ways. So yeah. Thank you guys. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's really fascinating as, I, as I'm thinking, I'm thinking about all of our webinar, all our attendees today, kind of picking up these nuggets. I think that um, the idea of being patient with yourself, um, particularly because if you have gotten into this work and you are like, okay, so I'm doing trauma informed training and I'm not a therapist, I'm not a clinician. And so I can imagine there's a great deal of, of anxiety around like, how do I do that? What if something comes up for a child? How do I provide a safe space? And so the extent to which we can listen and comfort um, foster resilience in, in children um, in our programs is really important and how we can use arts education to, to do just that. So I um, had another question for you guys. I have one Q&A from the audience, but I'm gonna ask you all to respond to this one in about two minutes and Reg, I already see you saying, when I ask it, I already see you saying two minutes, but about two minutes for this one. Um, how can implicit and explicit biases impact our ability to be trauma-informed? And what are two things that we can do about it? How does implicit bias impact our ability to be trauma-informed? And what are just two things we can do about it? Okay, I'm going to go first so that I make sure, and I'm putting a two-minute timer on now. So implicit bias, and they are absolutely, your, all of your bias is your barrier to, your, to being trauma-informed because your, your lens, your value, your identities, what you bring with you shape your expectations of people, right? And so you, the, the, the two, one of the two things you can do to be trauma-informed is really unpack what are your expectations of your students and why? Why do you have those expectations? And do those expectations actually serve what you need from the students in that classroom and in that moment and what society calls on for people in this day? And I think a real deep interrogation of expectations is how you move to being trauma informed. Right, we have this, like, why do we ask kids to line up to walk in the hallway? As adults, you don't line up to go anywhere. So why have a power battle over lines? Why do we have power battles over, you know, placement of desks and books in these corners, right? That, so just, and all of this is embedded 
in our teaching practices and expectations. So it's just truly a deep unpacking of why you want students to do things. And are you asking students to do things for your comfort or to actually aid in the delivery of instruction? And if it is for your comfort, that is absolutely okay, but say that. Develop that relationship with your students to say, I need for you to be quiet because I cannot work within this environment and develop that relationship. I'm done with it, 12 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you, Reggie. You did it, Reggie, you did it. <laughs> um, I've got two things as far as things that you can engage in and, and use in the classroom immediately. One, one is to understand um, classroom expectations. I just, I have some teachers who I've worked with It's like, well, here are the expectations and these are the rules and this is what we go through it every day. And I don't understand why they don't understand it. And I said, well, have you asked them what they need? I'm like, no. I said, well, how are they going to buy into what these classroom expectations are if they haven't had a voice either? There may be some things that you're missing but if you haven't asked them, you don't know. So if you're telling them what they need to do, but you haven't asked them what they need, why would they engage with you? Why would they follow those rules? So to open up those classroom expectations. So like Reggie was saying, this is what I need. You know, if it's, if I need it to be quiet, so then we can focus on this and saying what those expectations are and say, I want to know what you need in this classroom. So then they buy in, they feel like they have a say in what happened in the classroom too. Um, the other one would be loud students. I had a few teachers that say, well, I want them to come in and I want them to journal and be zen. I said, if they're coming off of recess or they're coming off the bus, they are so excited. They are seeing their friends first. Of all. So build in a moment for that excitement. If you feel like you need to structure it so you feel safe, then have an excitement kind of built in exercise that you all do at the very beginning that gets everybody engaged and connected and then work yourself down. And that's just a modulation thing too. You can't expect somebody who is up here to then all of a sudden take a deep breath and be here. They have to modulate themselves down. So meet them where they are when they come into the classroom and slowly work them down to where you want them to be, where they need to be so they can be safer and then engage in the learning. That's great, Azizi, thank you. So I have a follow-up question for you, Azizi. Um, what suggestions do you have for working trauma-informed practice into this new virtual space? We're virtual now, so any suggestions that you have um, for working trauma-informed practice into virtual classrooms? Yeah, for, for me, it's about the body, being able to see the body and the space. And, and right now I've got kids that when they come into our therapy sessions, their face is right here. <laughs> and I was like, I can't see you. So I say, so we purposely work on just moving the, the laptop or whatever they're using away from themselves so I can read their body language. Because it's one thing if they say, I'm feeling safe at home and you're seeing this and they're smiling. But when you back up, they're like this, I'm feeling safe at home, but they're wringing their hands and their body is tense. It's, it's a very different way to, to read what's going on with that child. So just being more aware of just what's happening with their surroundings, how they're moving through the space. Um, I work with uh, Erica Hornthal, she's a colleague of mine, and she just did a post about noticing a sudden change in movement. So if you have a child who is typically kind of contained and kind of small movements and they're very smooth, but then all of a sudden you get them on a call or you get them in the classroom and they're really like all over the place and they're super jerky and even their voice is, is cadenced differently. Notice that right away because that means something is off, that the movement has suddenly changed. So it's, it's really being aware of how that child is moving. And those are like your telltale signs that say something, let's check in with that kid. Thank you, Azizi. So I'm going to um, hold for a second. I have other questions for you guys. We got some great questions from our um, attendees. So I want to actually kick it over back over to Jackie to um, share a little bit about this great partnership um, that um, that we've had um, with CC with the Children's Theater and other partners. So I'll, tech, I'll, I'll pass it over to Jackie. 
Great, thank you. This is such an exciting panel. I'm really enjoying this. Um, well, very uh, quickly, we wanted to share with you, uh, for about 10 years, Chicago Children's Theater has been partnering with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to create programs for very young children. And typically these have been um, beautiful, uh, stories with music and very interactive and at the CSO in their beautiful rehearsal hall. And this year, of course, we were not able to create such an experience. And so having just come off of doing a lot of work with Carmen and the team at Lori Children's um, Center for Childhood Resilience, um, we started having conversations with the CSO about what could we do right now during this COVID time to really respond to the trauma and the stress that families are experiencing and something that could be really accessible for young children and for their parents and for those educators and people that are interacting with children all day long. And so uh, we found a beautiful book called My Magic Breath and it's by Nick Ordner and it is just a very simply illustrated, very lovely piece that really um, teaches children mindfulness and about harnessing their breath to calm themselves, to um, alleviate fears and anxieties. And it is performed, uh, well, it's read by our Chicago's First Lady. And uh, then we have the musicians from the CSO who were performing solo pieces from Bach. And uh, we weaved it all together with beautiful animation. And so we have just a couple of minutes of it that we want to share with you right now. Sometimes when you are worried or nervous or sad, deep breaths can help push some of those thoughts away. Think about when you feel happy, taking a big breath in and thinking about something that made you feel great will help you enjoy your happy moments even more. It's magic. Let's try it out. What happened today that made you smile? Take a deep breath in and picture that moment in your mind. Get ready. Let's blow out all those happy thoughts. <sighs> Now that looks like happiness. Keep blowing. <sighs> Keep thinking happy. That is a lot of happiness. That was great, Jackie. Thank you for sharing that. And I did have a follow-up question. So I'm looking at all of the wonderful feedback that you're getting in the chat. And I wonder if there is an arts organization that's, out, that's looking at that thinking, that is phenomenal. How do I even get started? Like, could you talk a little bit about, you know, Chicago Children's Theater really being forward thinking and saying we need to really sort of embed trauma informed practices and in everything that we do, starting with your partnership with Lori's that you mentioned. So what what advice would you give an arts organization that's like, I, I really want to, I really want to go where they're going? What advice would you give them? Well, I mean, I think this is a great start, you know, just getting here and getting informed and learning. And, you know, it's it's a very hot topic right now. I think that there's lots of information available online. There are plenty of organizations, I think, around the country uh, that people can access and, and learn from. 
And, you know, really, as you were saying at the beginning, it's, it's a lens, it's a mindset. And I think that we as artists can continually to ask ourselves, what can I do? What can I do to be more trauma informed myself, as well as how can I help people who maybe this art form is going to be that that particular path for them to be able to um, feel heard, to feel expression. Um, and so, uh, you know, this time that we're in, um, we definitely have a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges. And I think it's every time we go to work, we say, how can I be helpful? How can I engage? How can I reach these children right now who need us more than ever? So it's not a time to sit back. It's really a time to like really dig in. And so this partnership is just an example of, of how we're digging in right now. And we've been hearing from parents and from educators. They love this piece. They're using it in the classroom. Uh, one of the teachers wrote to us and said that she's using it so that she plays the music and the children are drawing. And so she's really combining a, a moment of self-expression for them as well. Parents have told us they use it at night. They use it for themselves. And again, taking care of ourselves is really a, a super important thing that we're learning about all of this work, so. Thank you, Jackie. That was beautiful. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I've seen the, um, the, the full piece and it is pretty fantastic. So um, check it out. I know some of you have done that because we got great feedback in the chat, but it is absolutely fantastic. So, so check that out. Um, so I'm going to actually go back to our panelists for just a second. And um, we have a question here that I'm going to toss to Reggie and then certainly Azizi if you, if you want to chime in as well. So as a society, we've been going through a huge trauma um, and our lives are really being shifted upside down due to COVID along with all of the other traumas that it's caused. Um, so this person is presenting um, collective trauma. And so the question is, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on addressing the collective traumas that students have been going through. Yeah, that's a great question. I saw that in the chat and I have a few thoughts about that. So I think that, so I'll, I'll, I wanna offer this, this as an answer. So we know that particularly, so we know that part of what, um, impacts the experience of a trauma is the social emotional supports around a person, right? And so I just think it's really important to know that human beings are highly resilient and children are highly resilient and given the proper supports um, are able to endure a lot. And so I think it's important for us to just to know and understand that all that all really sort of negative things that happen in a child's life may not land as a trauma if there are supports in place, right? So, I, And so the, the reason why this comes up is that I was just talking to my godson and, um, and he was talking about COVID and he just had this like very nuanced, really beautiful, quite adult view of the situation. And I was like, oh, you're fine. Like you're you're better than me, <laughs> like, you know. Like like I, I, I and what it made me realize, I was like, oh yeah, no, you have all of these supports processing this that I don't have as an adult who is a who is a therapist, right? And so one, so I just wanted to offer this. So I say that I think that like as we are offering our children supports, I think it's important to know that if you were thinking that way and you were attending these webinars and you were doing things to attend to your your students that you are also helping them endure this. And I think that again, with collective trauma, it's that same, it's that same network of care, right? I think, you know, Carmen, you mentioned before, it's like, it's like not talking about it. It's not acknowledging it that, that, that makes things land, but it's the idea of having this conversation about like, this is hard and we're gonna figure out how to get through this together. And we know that this is compounded with other things that that actually is, is critical to helping students navigate those collective traumas. You know, one thing, Reg, you mentioned, and then I'll, I'll toss it over to Azizi if you want to, it to also respond, was this idea of, of resilience. And I think that fostering resilience, it's, it's not really rocket science, but there are some critical factors and components to that. But when I think about the um, healing from collective trauma in the context of relationships, 
and really thinking about community care. So we talk about like self-care and we, we push back on the idea of like the spa. We talk about like finding our breath and taking a minute. Like what can we do in the moment to take care of ourselves when we're feeling distressed? But I also think about in terms of collective trauma, I'm thinking about collective and community care and the value of not, not only checking in with ourselves, but checking in with each other. The value of providing space for a child to talk. And as the adult, we're just in the space and we just listen and comfort. That's it. And we listen, we listen non-judgmentally with unconditional positive regard. And we are just in the space with the child in the best authentic way that we can. And I think that that also helps to, to um, this idea of healing from collective trauma as a, as a um, collective care being a mechanism of doing that. And also just listening and comforting and being with the child in the moment and help them just kind of talk through and think through some of these stressful things, because that is a key to taking, to, for something to not become a traumatic thing, is the, is the adult relationships and supports that are in the child's life. And for many of you, all of you who are here today, you know, you, for all intents and purposes, might be the trusted adult in the life of a child. And so how you use that sphere of influence to, to listen and comfort is a critical piece. So um, thank you, Reggie, for you just got kind of got me thinking about that. Aziz, did you want to? Did you want to? Yeah, in? yeah. I wanted to add in humor. <laughs> I, we laugh a lot, and I was just thinking about um, my oldest daughter last night. We had been talking about, oh, what are we going to tell you know your kids when you get older about this experience? What you know? What have you? What have you learned? What have you gone through? What has this been like for you? You know, this is me as a therapist talking to my child. And so we were laughing about it because all these funny stories started coming to her mind. And so we were noticing some similarities in the song, The 12 Days of Christmas. And so spur of the moment right there, we wrote our own version instead of the 12 days of Christmas, we wrote the 12 months of Corona. And so we had two ply toilet paper. We had five tiger Kings. Like we were cracking up and I woke up my youngest daughter and she came in, what are you guys doing? And we started singing it and she was like, oh, you got to add this. And so for like 45 minutes of just pure joy and laughter about this ridiculous thing that we're going through. And now we have this song that every time we come back to it, we are just dying laughing. It is humor brought into a moment that feels so chaotic, but it was something that brought us together. So there again, like there's the arts being able to play into a collective trauma. Thank you for bringing in the idea of humor because I think that is so, um, so important and actually getting some people saying amen to that. So folks are chiming in in the chat, um, really feeling what you and, and Reggie are talking about this evening. So um, so what I wanted to do, Azizi, um, if it's okay, is I wanted to share, so, um, so to all of our folks here, Azizi has a couple of slides she would like to share um, with us regarding her work as a drama therapist. And so uh, that might be uh, helpful for some of the teaching artists and educators here with us this evening. So um, our producer is going to get those queued up. And then Azizi is going to walk us through a couple of things. So you'll hear from her. you hear from her next. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to just explain the difference in drama therapy versus a, a theater session. So when you think about coming in, you do your warm-ups, you get yourself ready for um, rehearsal, you go through the scenes, and when you're done, you talk about, okay, what went well in the scenes? What do we need to improve on? You're like, all right, great, bye, have a great time. Some of you may do it a little bit differently, but I wanted to show you how a drama therapist approaches uh, an actual group. So here's the group format. So we have a check-in, and this is the point in what I call the counseling session where the client can, can acknowledge anything that's coming up for them. So you may have the best laid plan, and you think that you're going to be doing this one thing, and it's going to be amazing, but when they check in, you realize that they're not ready for that. Or they could be ready, but you need to change what those warm-ups are going to be. You may have to do more warm-ups to get them to that main thing. So then you work your way to the warm up, and that's getting them prepared, whether that's working through the body, getting the voice warmed up, getting connections. If you're doing some, some scene and partner work, you're having them work together. And then you move into that major activity. So that's 
the main intervention in any drama therapy session. So it's typically ensemble work, scene work, all of the members are included and are expected to participate. And we also wanna stress that to participate, you can also participate as an audience member. So again, when I was telling you the story earlier about that enactment with the young kid who was um, discovering what it would be like if he actually acted on his impulses, well, it was so powerful for the audience too because they took away so much from that. So just remembering that. And then what's different in drama therapy versus theater is you have this debrief and processing the scene. So it's not just how did the scene go, it's what did you feel like playing that role? What emotions came up for you? How did this connect with you and your own story? And how can you shift some things for yourself in your own life? And then you have the closure. So sometimes people will step into roles and I'll go into that a little bit further. They step into roles that are uncomfortable. So sometimes they may have to play the aggressor and that can feel really yucky. And so they want to be able to de-roll and not have to take that home. Or they play the, the victim role too in a scene and they don't wanna take that home. So there's things that you can do, whether it's taking the role off, pretending like you're rubbing the role or you take the role off and you throw it in the middle of the pile or whatever that may be. And then also in the processing, you're saying their name. So you're saying their name directly, not the character they just played, but you're saying their name so they can come back and ground themselves again. And so that's the closure of a group format for drama therapy. And so we can go to the next slide so I can show you the pie. That's my favorite thing. So this was created by Sally Bailey. She was my mentor when I became a drama therapist and she trained me. And this is the drama therapy pie. So you think of a drama therapist as doing all these things and we do, we get trained generally in all of these things, but just like a therapist, we, therapists specialize in certain things. So drama therapists also specialize in certain things. So for me, my my specialization is more towards this bottom part of the pie. I love performance. I love theater of the oppressed, going in and working with, with marginalized communities and having them tell their story. I love that. Um, playback theater is another one for some of you that are aware of that. Therapeutic spiral methods, psychodrama and sociodrama, they go almost together in the same pie slice, but they're somewhat different. So sociodrama is where you would address some of that collective trauma because it's a story of the community. And then they have psychodrama. Psychodrama is also focusing on uh, mostly like a traumatic event or a story that somebody wants to reenact. And that is then played out very structured, very, very structured. Therapeutic spiral method, this is the trauma-informed pie slice of psychodrama. So psychodrama can be very, very in your face. Wow, what did I get myself into? Um, and so if you want to think about going into a trauma reenactment, you don't want to put the person right in that trauma scene. That will re-traumatize them for sure. So the therapeutic spiral method is a way to slowly wind them into the scene. So you start with warming them up, talking about it, bringing in their supports, who was with you, who do you connect with, working them down to that scene. And there's even body, body doubles and a lot of things that play into this. And then you don't shoot them back up again. You want to slowly bring them back to present time, bringing them more mindful and back into their space. So that's where I love to live. There's also developmental transformation. That's where you're doing a lot of improv within a safety of a circle. There's role play and role method. That's where a lot of the stuff comes into play with what roles do the people play in their life? What roles do they want to play? And they get to experience those. And then the ones that are more on the safer side that um, teaching artists can really step into, improvisation, drama games, ritual, that comes into play all the time masks and puppets and performance. So these are all the pie slices of a drama therapist that we learn about and then we each kind of find our jam and, and work with those ourselves. Great, great. Thank you, Azizi. And I was looking at the chat. Do you have some, um, some people in the choir saying amen to all the things that you're saying? So um, thank you for sharing that. I was really fascinating. Um, I'm learning so much from you, from you guys. So what I thought that we could actually do is um, I have a couple of questions um, that the attendees have um, 
presence, and I thought that we could go back and answer that. So there is one question um, here that says, how should we respond when student interaction causes a chaotic environment for, for another? Um, how do we make that environment better for one student while not unhealthily curbing another? So I wonder, is this kind of getting at um, sort of like behavior management, managing expectations, creating a safe environment, restorative practices? And so um, either Reggie or Z, do you have any thoughts about, about that? Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. I mean, I think that, I mean, so this is the balance, right, of a classroom. But one, I think that you, you part of doing this work is the culture that you set up from the very beginning, right? And so the conversations that you have with your classrooms about, you know, about our, all, you, all of our unique needs and that we might have moments where we are not the best versions of ourselves. And we, instead of hiding from it, and we're afraid like, oh, let's not give them ideas. Let's describe it, right? Let's talk about what happens if someone gets upset and they run out of the classroom or your chair gets thrown. What does that mean? And how do we give those, those you know, our one of us space to, you know, have that expression? Then how do we repair the harm that that caused afterwards and bring people back into the fold? And so the idea is to, you know, just, hope that it doesn't happen, but to know this, because if you, you know, you know, right? And we all know those kids, you can see it in the beginning. Educators have a sixth sense. You know, you have to trust it. You know, when you walk into a classroom that is getting ready to be off the chain, right? Like you're not surprised. It never comes out of left field. When you have your spidey senses on, you're like, oh man, right? Lean into it, lean into it. Don't, don't, don't hope that it, it you know, nothing happens and then have that conversation, right? And make a plan for it. The one thing I will offer is that particularly with um, kids who are, I call them runners. Um, when you know you have runners, run the path with them. Run the path with them. Say, okay, run the path. And you do it over and over and over and over so that, that kid runs to the place that is safe and it's not that much of a disruption, and you can just do a quick check-in with where that kid is, right? There are ways to, um, I think, address all that work, but the common theme is to, again, bring, bring, that, bring it all to human level and just understand that the, and some of us may respond this way, others of us may never respond, but we're all a part of the same community, and this is what folks need. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. And so Azizi, if I could take you back. So earlier, um, you, we, uh, you were talking through like how to support um, students um, in this virtual world that we're in now. And so we had a follow-up question. So if I could take you back to that for just a moment. And the follow-up question that came in earlier was, do you have any thoughts on checking in with students virtually when something seems off, but they won't engage back? They're either like off camera or not responding to chat. So any thoughts on on how to engage students um, virtually when something seems off, how to check in with them when they won't respond. Um, so that's going outside of the classroom. I mean, that's that's taking your time outside of that allotted 45 minutes or hour that you have with them and reaching out to um, a caregiver or the child directly if you can and just say, hey, I noticed like, you know, I didn't see you or you kind of have cameras. I just want to make sure everything's all right. You want to tell me what was going on with your day um, and, and checking in with them that way. So then that way they have an opportunity to let you know, because they may not be ready in that moment to tell you what's actually going on. But if you give them a moment, let them think about it, or even just sit with whatever feelings they may be having. And then you, you just even let them know, say, Hey, even in the chat, like personally, and just say a private message. Hey, are you okay? You know what? Since I don't see you, I'm going to be checking in with you in a couple hours just to, to see if everything's all right and if you need anything. And so that way they even know that that's what you're going to be doing. That also sets it up so then when they do it again, they know you're going to do that again. So be like, oh man, I don't want her calling me again. So, <laughs> so they'll be on camera or they'll, they'll, they'll follow through or hopefully follow through those expectations them of them being engaged because they know you're going to follow through and follow up with why they weren't. 
Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Aziz. All right, so we have, um, we're at time, so I have one last question for you guys. This is like our lightning round before we close. We got about 55 or so folks in the house with us this evening. And so what would be one or two things that you, if someone's sitting here saying, you know, I want to take this, I want to share this with my team, I want to move this work forward in my own sphere of influence, what is, what is one or two things somebody could take away from today to kind of work their sphere of influence and move this conversation forward? What are two things folks can do when they go back into their, their places and spaces? What, what, what could be um, some marching orders for folks who are joining us today? I mean, I would say my biggest thing is, is uh, individual and an or organizational interrogation of values and expectations, right? Deeply, a deep interrogation of who you are, why you are, and how that shows up and how that plays out in, in the expectations you have for your students and for yourself and as an organization. And then a constant way of reflecting on why. Why are you doing the work? Why are we doing this work? And why is this work important and relevant? And I think that you know, using that as your North Star, your guiding star um, is a great way to um, begin the trauma-informed journey. Yeah, I would echo that. That culture is key, knowing exactly why your organization is doing what they're doing. That's why that's why organizations work so hard on their mission statement. But then sometimes the mission statement has to change based on the community that you're working with. And so it's nice to have one and it's it's nice to have it is you have that North Star knowing though that, I mean, we got the coronavirus, so North Stars shift sometimes. And so as long as you have that guided principle, like this is why we're here. And then here are some things that can shift around that guidance so that we can meet the community where they are. Perfect, thank you. All right, so I want to thank everybody, all the people in the house today. I wanna thank you guys for joining us. I also have a couple of parting thoughts. And so these are some, some resonations that I have. This idea of leaning in, um, inter, uh, interrogation of values, right? Asking why, looking at your culture, your climate, your vision, your mission, your guiding principles, being restorative and using humor and the value and the power of authentic relationships with unconditional positive regard, right? We're, we're, we're in all of our work with, with young people thinking about your sphere of influence and the places and spaces where you can really have some impact, knowing that it takes all of us to move this work forward. And really thinking about self-awareness and kind of acknowledging what's coming up for us and armed with that knowledge gives us the ability to ask ourselves some questions as we sort of build trauma-informed arts programming all across the city, all across the state, and um, in all in every place and space where, where kids are to have these types of supports and services. So I wanna thank our panelists, Azizi Marshall, of course, and Reggie Harris. And I want to um, thank the Ch- Chicago Children's Theater. And I want to send a shout out to my team, the Lurie Children's Hospital Center for Childhood Resilience and uh, Illinois Humanities for their support. And I think I'm going to mention the next webinar and I'm going to pass it to Jackie maybe, or just mention the, the next webinar. Okay, so I'm mentioning the next webinar. Make sure you guys join us next week for, for part three of our webinar series, Trauma-Informed Arts Curriculum for Early Childhood Education. You guys have a fantastic, fantastic evening. Thank you so much for joining us and see you later, everybody.